Hello and welcome to part two of STEMI recognition. Uh, this is the second video of two. In the first video we talked about the coronary vasculature and a little bit about ECG and how it works. And uh, in this section we're going to be focusing on ST segment elevations and what that means as far as myocardial infarction is concerned. Uh, so when cardiac tissues start for oxygen, the conduction pathways change through the tissue. And this is not well understood by medicine at this time, but the upshot is that you'll see something different on an ECG when there's damage. Uh, the movement of current through damaged myocardium looks different, and we see it as ST elevations. That's what we'll be looking for when we run our 12 leads to see if there's damage to the heart muscle. So back when we talked about the cardiac rhythm, we discussed the uh, P wave, QRS, and T waves, as, as you know. And here's our P wave. Here is our QRS complex. And this is our T wave over here. And then we discussed uh, the ST segment, which is the end of the S wave to the beginning of the T wave. So this is our ST segment right here. And we talked about the J point. And we said the J point was going to be important when we discussed ST elevation. So remember what the J point is? The definition we gave was it is the spot on the ECG where the QRS complex makes a radical change in direction. So where the up down starts to become a left right movement. And for our ECG here, the J point point is right in this area. So this is J point there. If we look for our isoelectric line on this, we'll note the J point is on the isoelectric line. So in between any deflections, we're seeing that the J point's right there, which is where we want it to be. So this would be considered normal. Let's look at this lead or this view here. Here we have a J point up there and we've got our isoelectric line down here. So isoelectric line is much lower than where the J point is up here. Uh, it's lower by one, two, three, four millimeters. So we have four millimeters of ST elevation here. And that just means that the current moving through this cardiac tissue is moving through damaged cardiac tissue. This is what we're seeing on the ECG. So when we look for elevations, we're looking for a J point that is higher than the isoelectric line. It's clinically significant when the elevation is two millimeters or greater in the chest leads or the V leads, so V1 through V6. And it is clinically significant when we see it one meter or higher in the other leads. So this would be your augmented limb leads, one, two, three, and then AVR, AVL, and AVF. And they have to occur in two or more contiguous leads. So remember, contiguous, we said, are adjacent leads, or leads that look at the same area of the heart. So if we see this, this is where it's going to be clinically significant. So here's an ECG. And what we're going to notice on here are some elevations right off the bat. So our isoelectric line, as indicated, is right here. We have a J point right there, and we know that there is an elevation here. And in fact, there are elevations all over the place on this. So these elevations are electricity traveling through damaged myocardium. Where in the myocardium are we having damage? We have to go back and look at the leads. Remember, each lead looks at a different spot in the heart. So here is lead one, and this is lead AVL. Lead one and AVL, these are high lateral leads. So this is the high lateral portion of the heart. Remember, V1 and V2 are septal. So we have a septal lead here involved. We have V3 and V4, which are the anterior. So these are anterior wall of the heart. And then we have V5 and V6, which is low lateral. So we have high lateral, part of a septal wall, and then anterior and low lateral. So basically, you're looking at anterior wall and lateral wall. And this is what they would call an anterolateral STEMI. So we have STEMI to the anterior portion, low lateral, with some extension into the septal wall as well. ST elevations give us that information. Sometimes we'll see reciprocal depressions. And I want to really emphasize sometimes, because I've talked to a few medics uh, over the last couple of years who believe that you have to see ST depressions in order to verify STEMI, and you do not. It's sometimes. So ST elevations is what we're looking for. 
sometimes you'll see reciprocal depressions. And what that means is that in areas away from the damaged part of the heart, you'll see a J point below the isoelectric line. All right. So there's your J points below the isoelectric line. Look where the actual elevations are. You've got elevation in V2. You've got elevation in V3. And then you have these maybe a little bit in V1 also, uh, but then you have areas away from that part of the heart where the depression occurs. So you have a, a J point below the isoelectric line in two, below isoelectric line in three, below isoelectric line in AVF. So those are your inferior leads. So the actual STEMI is occurring in the septal anterior portion of the heart, and then away from that part of the heart is the inferior wall, and that's where your ST depressions are. So not required to be there for us to diagnose, no STEMI, but they're kind of icing on the cake. They add to our suspicion of STEMI. Baseline and serial ECGs. It's important for us to get a baseline ECG, and there's an important reason why. Baseline, we get baseline vitals. When you first arrive on scene, you get a baseline blood pressure, you get a heart rate, you get a pulse, respirations, and it's good for us to look at that initially because then we can see if any changes have occurred over time. When we get a baseline ECG, we do a 12 lead and we see what it looks like. Think about what's happening in the case of a STEMI. If we have a STEMI occurring, we're going to have an ST elevation. So here's our P wave, here's a QRS, and then there is your elevation and your T wave. All right, so we have this spot right here, which is ST elevation. What's causing that? You've got a coronary artery somewhere that's blocked. So here's a coronary artery. Right? You've got some blockage in here, and it's causing this area of tissue, wherever this is on the heart, to not get oxygen and blood supply. When we give nitrates, because the person's having chest pain, right, what we're doing is we're actually decreasing the peripheral resistance in the vasculature, which takes some of the workload off of the heart, and we're starting to open up a little bit and restore some blood flow to these areas. So if the blood's actually getting to this area now, and you're getting some perfusion into here, what's going to happen to the ST elevation? And it can go away. So you can get the ST elevation that was there, it starts to normalize and then you don't have it, all right? Have you fixed the problem? No, this blockage is still sitting in there. We've just treated the symptom. And if you give your nitrates first and then do your 12 lead, this is what you might see, all right? You have a person with chest pain, you've given them some nitrates, then you do a 12 lead, you don't see an ST elevation there. Now we're trying to figure out if this is a cardiac related chest pain or if it's something else. If we get the baseline first, we see there's an elevation, then we treat with nitrates and the other appropriate medications, and we have verification that this is in fact a heart attack, and we can get these people to the appropriate place. Uh, now, in our protocols, we are not supposed to be giving nitrates to patients who have inferior wall STEMI. So people who have elevations in two, three, and AVF. The reason is because when we have inferior wall STEMIs, we can also have right ventricular involvement. Now our normal 12 lead does not look at the right side of the heart, but if you have infarction in the right ventricle, your preload drops and you can be very unstable in responding to nitrates. So you can get these precipitous drops in blood pressure. There is a way to see if you have right ventricular involvement and that involves taking your V4 lead off of the patient and sticking it on the mirror image side of your of your patient's right side of the chest. So you take V4 out of its spot, mid clavicular line, fifth intercostal space on the left side of the chest, and you put it on the fifth intercostal space on the right mid clavicular line. And we call that V4R. And then you run your 12 lead again, knowing that your V4 lead is actually this. And if you see elevations in this lead, then we know that we have right ventricular involvement or RVI, and that's someone we want to avoid giving nitrates to. We still, by protocol, don't want to give nitrates to inferior STEMIs, even with uh, verification that there is no right involvement until we talk to a doctor, but we don't want to throw nitrates in immediately. We want to call and fax an ECG and talk to them. It's also important to do serial ECGs so we can see the evolution or uh, de-evolution of the STEMI as we transport the patient. Here is a patient who was uh, treated, picked up at uh, 2300 hours and 24 minutes. And as you can see, we have some ST elevations in lead to three and AVF, indicating that there is a STEMI here and there's a blockage somewhere in the coronary artery, probably in the right 
coronary artery. Because this is an inferior wall STEMI, the crews contacted medical control, checked vital signs, and did get orders to administer nitrates. And notice that uh, one half hour later, after nitrates and oxygen, morphine, and aspirin, that those are gone. The elevations are gone. And in fact, there were also initially some ST uh, reciprocal depressions here, and those are gone as well. So you can see that by treating with nitrates and doing what you're supposed to do, we're making the patient better, but we're also getting rid of that. And without the notation here on the ECG of STEMI, we may not get the opportunity to see that in the field. This is a person who might come into the hospital pain-free after nitrates with no changes on the ECG, and then they sit in the ER until they actually develop symptoms again, when they could be up in the lab getting cath already. Treat the patient, not the monitor, is a saying that's probably well overused, but the point of this is that there are two protocols that we have. One is chest pain. Chest pain is just that. It's chest pain, and if we suspect that it's cardiac in nature, we have a treatment for it. We give aspirin, we do a 12-lead ECG, get our baseline, we give nitro, we give morphine, and uh, we treat chest pain that way. Notice that it says, if confirmed STEMI, follow confirmed STEMI protocol. We have a separate protocol for STEMI. So the point that I'm trying to make is that just because you don't see elevations on the monitor does not mean the patient's not having a heart attack. And there are providers who will withhold treatment because they'll say, oh, I didn't see anything on the cardiac monitor, but the patient can still be having chest pain. If you get to a STEMI early enough, you may not see any changes at all for the first few minutes until the heart starts to actually have some tissue death. So regardless of what the 12 lead says, if you have symptoms of chest pain and other cardiac problems, that are suspected to be cardiac related, we're still gonna treat with aspirin, nitrates, morphine, and oxygen if need be. And we're gonna continually monitor that 12 lead ECG for changes. Sometimes we'll see things on an ECG that look bad, but actually aren't. We are not cardiologists. We do not have the training and background in cardiology and, and we don't read enough 12 leads quite honestly for us to pick out the minutia of, of what could and couldn't be going on. So it's important for us to know that we're not making diagnosis on these different abnormal 12 leads. We should probably consult with the doctor and fax he's over. But one of the frequent things that can happen is you can get a mimic of a STEMI. So you'll get something that looks like ST elevation, but it's actually not. Uh, this is left bundle branch block. So left bundle branch block, remember, just means there's a, a blockage in the conduction system uh, traveling from the bundle of Hiss down through the uh, left and right bundle branches, and there's a delay in there. So what the delay does is it causes sometimes a notch, like right here, and you'll also see the widening of the uh, of the QRS complex. So notice this is wide, almost a full box. Uh, you'll see some notching here. So this is indicative of, of left bundle branch block. In the presence of left bundle branch block, we cannot diagnose STEMI in the field, all right? So we cannot diagnose STEMI in the field. And the reason why is because that blockage in the conduction system can make it look like there is ST elevation. Look at here, this looks like ST elevation. This looks like ST elevation. It may be ST elevation, but because of the aberrancy of the conduction, we don't know for sure. So in these cases, you're going to want to fax this over to the hospital, and you're going to basically treat the patient with the symptoms that they have. Fax this to the ER, call the doc, have them look at it. Now, new onset, if this is brand new, and they've never had this before, new onset left bundle branch block, in the presence of cardiac type symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, all that, usually is enough for them to activate the cath lab, but we can't do that in the field on our own. We have to get a physician to take a look at that. The other problem is that we don't know if it's new onset because we never have access to a previous ECG the patient has done. But for our purposes, if the patient is not having a heart history, has acute coronary syndrome type symptoms now and shows you left bundle branch block. It's something you want to fax to the ER, contact the physician, talk about it, and see what the appropriate destination might be for this patient. They may say take them to the cath lab. They may say go to your local hospital, wherever the patient wants to go.
There's some other stuff that we should be concerned about. And again, we can't make these diagnoses, but we can look at them and see them as abnormalities. And uh, these are not STEMI, but when you see these things at 12 weeks, it should be faxed to the ER and the doctor should be consulted regarding an appropriate transport destination. So when you have acute coronary syndrome symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, nausea, all that good stuff, if you have any one of these four things, poor R wave progression, inversion of T wave, new onset, bundle branch block, which we just talked about, or ST depressions without elevations, this is still something we want to fax over to the hospital and take a look at. When we talk about R wave progression, here is a normal ECG. So everything on this ECG is actually what we consider normal or baseline normal. And when we talk about R wave progression, we're just looking at the six precordial leads. So we're talking about V1 through V6. Watch what the QRS complex looks like, the R wave, all right? You have a predominantly downward R wave in V1. As you go into V2, this turns into a biphasic R wave. QRS complex. In the V3, it becomes more upright, but still a little bit multiphasic there. By V4 and into V5 and 6, we should have a completely upright QRS complex. And in fact, V5 should be a little bit bigger normally than V6 as far as amplitude. So normal R wave progression looks like this, mostly downward, kind of biphasic, slowly transitioning to all upward through V4, through V6. You can have late or early transitions. You can have no transitions. And when you don't see normal R wave progression, uh, I'm going to underline it again, but this may indicate an anterior MI. So people with a abnormal R wave progression who don't have a cardiac history may be having an MI. Here is an ECG from a patient who is having an MI. And in fact, this patient had a 99% uh, left anterior descending artery occlusion when they went into the PCI lab. So he's got quite a bit of blockage there. But notice there's really not any significant ST elevation here. There's a tiny bit of ST elevation right in V1. You can kind of talk yourself into about a millimeter of ST elevation in V2, but that's it. Uh, and on, on the surface, as far as elevations go, this ECG looks okay. But notice the progression of the R wave, downward, 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 downward. It gets biphasic only in V5, and it's not even totally upright yet in V6. So this is an abnormal R wave progression. And again, if this patient's having acute coronary syndrome type symptoms, this is an ECG we can fax over to the hospital and say, look, we see a poor R wave progression here. We're concerned about an anterior, uh, anterior MI. What do you think we should do? Consult with the doctor and just see what they think. Have them look at the ECG, but uh, this is a situation where, again, the patient did have 99% occlusion of left anterior descending. T waves are funny things. T waves can change for all different types of reasons. They can get tall and peaked with hyperkalemia. They can flatten out with hypokalemia. There are lots of reasons for T wave inversions, right? But what you're seeing here is a T wave that is normally upright is now upside down. There's one. There's one. This is not, again, a diagnosis of STEMI. However, if you have a patient with symptoms that are associated with coronary syndrome, chest pain and a lot, and we see inverted T waves, this is of concern. Fax to the hospital, give the doctor a call, tell them what you're seeing, and see if transport to the PCI center is what they think is the best for that patient. New onset bundle branch block we discussed. So here's your uh, little notched QRS complexes here, here's your widened QRS complexes and your V leads, uh, and you see what looks like elevations here. May or may not be STEMI. We don't know. But again, if it's new onset, we are concerned about it. Give the doctor a call and have him take a look at the facts. We talked about depressions in reciprocal depressions so that when you have a STEMI in areas away from the heart, we get depressions. If you only see depressions, notice there's really, well, there's kind of a elevation here, but everywhere else there's really no elevation. You're mostly seeing depressions. If you're seeing depressions, but no elevations, and you have cardiac symptoms, uh, again, fax it over to the hospital. This can be a sign of a possible posterior wall MI. So everything in the back of the heart is going to be opposite from the front of the heart when we do an EKG. So you're going to see depressions instead of elevations. But this can be a posterior wall MI. So another thing to be suspicious of, to fax over to the hospital and speak with the doctor about. So at this time, we have a couple of sample ECGs. What I recommend doing is pausing the video when uh, we read off the name of the ECG and then unpause it when you think you have a diagnosis and then we'll discuss. So sample A, 
in looking at this ECG, first thing you're going to note pretty clearly here is ST elevations. So you're going to see a J point right here and your isoelectric line right here. So we have an ST elevation in two, we have certainly an ST elevation in three, and we have an ST elevation in AVF. We've also got some reciprocal depressions here in V3 and V2 and V1 up here. So this, well, actually we have some in V5 as well. 2, 3 AVF correspond to inferior wall, and then we have uh, ST depressions, that's icing on the cake, so we're going to call this a inferior wall STEMI. Next ECG, sample beat, all right? ST elevations, lead 1, ST elevation, AVL, huge ST elevations in leads V2, V3, and all the rest of these, V6, these are tombstones forming here, V5, V4, and you can talk yourself into a ST depression over here. So remember, leads 1, AVL, lateral wall, V5, V6, lateral wall, we have septal, anterior, so this is going to be an anterior lateral STEMI. ECG sample C. Very prominent ST elevations, 2, 3, AVF. So we know that that corresponds with inferior wall, uh, very prominent depression in V2. Uh, we also have, interestingly enough, some elevations in V5 and V6. This is an inferior lateral, inferior lateral STEMI. So this is ugly, sample D. We take a look at this, we see a couple things. Um, you're seeing what looks like elevations here. Right, this kind of looks like ST elevations, but notice that this is a wide QRS complex. So what we have here is a bundle branch block. And because this is a downward QRS in V1, we're going to call this a left bundle branch block. So this is left bundle branch block. Remember, we cannot diagnose STEMI in the presence of a bundle branch block. However, if this is new onset or the patient is having chest pain or difficulty breathing or any of those things associated with the coronary problem, then this is something we're going to fax over to the hospital and say, here's what we got. What you'll also notice is that we have very, very poor R wave progression here. So downward, 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 downward doesn't actually flip up until v, V5 and V6. So this is an ugly ECG. Uh, it looks like it might be a atrial fibrillation type of situation with left bundle branch block, but in the presence of chest pain, we're gonna treat this ACS and we're gonna fax it over to the hospital. This is an example of a bad capture, right? Notice this, Wee! we have this wandering isoelectric line down here. This is the result of patient movement. Because you have this wandering line, you can't really tell if this is elevation or if this is just the product of the patient moving in this up and down baseline. So in this case, it's just a bad ECG and you're gonna have to take another one to be sure. Have the patient sit still. Um, remember each section is 2.5 seconds. So 2.5 seconds for leads to one, two, and three, and then it goes 2.5 seconds for those three leads. So the actual ECG takes 10 seconds of beats, but it only looks at three leads at a time. So that's why you get the wandering baseline here. Patient was probably moving when this started and then stopped moving for the rest of the ECG. Definitely going to need to get a new one on here. Once again, inferior wall, two, three, AVF. You also have some reciprocal depressions in V2 and V1, and slight ST elevations in V6. So this is going to be uh, inferior and lateral ST elevations, and consider infarct. It says right up on top there. Don't always listen to the computer because the computer's not right. Trust your, own, trust your own judgment, but there you go. Here is an interesting one. So we have some elevation, looks like in lead one. We have some possible elevation in AVL, but we definitely have elevation in V5 and V6. Looks like some elevation in V3, V2. So we have here lateral wall, anterior wall. So anterior lateral STEMI. When you look at this one, you're gonna have to look closely because there's really only one thing on here. Slight 
maybe slight elevations here and here. But notice that you have really bad R wave progression. So downward, 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 biphasic in V4, and then only gets up right in V6 here. All right. So combined with chest pain, we have what looks like to be a septal wall, septal anterior wall, possibly infarct, but definitely have poor R wave progression through here. In summary, hopefully what you've picked up from this presentation and from me talking for a while, increase your index of suspicion. So 12 leads really should be for anything that appears out of the ordinary, including people who are just ill. Like I said, I do 12 leads on every patient who is not a trauma uh, for most complaints as part of our normal vital signs. You might catch something. Proper lead placement, chest prep, and patient positioning should be used for excellent ECG capture. If you can't capture ECG with the proper placement of leads and without the patient moving an artifact, you can't get a diagnostic quality ECG. Remember to get a baseline ECG before you administer medications and serial ECGs afterwards so you can see if the uh, STEMI is getting worse or better. Any 12 leads that have elevations and all 12 leads that are questionable or confusing, like the ones we talked about there, should be faxed to the appropriate hospital and med control should be contacted. So get this over to, fax it over to PCI Center, GVI, wherever you're going, and ask them to take a look at it, see what they think. Remember, some ST elevations are not STEMI. We look at the bundle branch blocks, and some MIs do not have elevations. So treat your patient. If you have chest pain that looks like it's possibly cardiac related, Give them the meds, do the 12 lead. Even if you don't see anything, remember that ACS protocol versus STEMI protocol, you're still going to give nitrates, morphine, oxygen, aspirin, and we're going to contact the physician with a 12 lead to see what they think. Here's a big one. Patients with cardiac suspicious symptoms should be treated with oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, and possibly morphine regardless of what the 12 leads show. So that kind of piggybacks off of that. Now remember, in our protocols, we are looking for a O2 an SpO2 of below 94. So if your oxygen level is 94 or above, you don't need to give oxygen. And in fact, what you're probably going to see very soon in protocols is that's going to prohibit that because you can actually have a negative impacts on your patients with STEMI, uh, heart attacks, and strokes for giving them oxygen. But if they're short of breath, obviously we're giving them uh, oxygen. And if their SATs are below 94, we'll give them oxygen. Last thing, make sure you upload your monitor to your PCR. That's per our policy, and that's also for the state. We need to have a copy of that 12 lead and any ECGs you ran while you were on that call to add to the patient record. Thank you very much for watching this presentation, and uh, if you're a TCA employee, there is a quiz for CME credit that is attached to this. Uh, if you're not a TCA employee and you would like to comment or discuss anything about the ECG presentation, please feel free to contact me. I am Sean Halsman. I'm Director of Education at Twin City Ambulance Corporation, and my email is right there. It's shalsman at tcaems.com. Go out there, be great, be safe, and treat your patients well.